routine, a journey by night. By the way, I have these for you, I say to Breton, reaching into my inventory and pulling out ten zombie heads. Splendid, Reverend Cadmont, splendid. I trust the sword was a useful addition to your armoury. It was. I motion to unbuckle the sword belt. Keep it, with my best wishes. I feel bad for disliking him now. I turn the quest informally and I get a message. Success. You have completed the quest of the zombie heads. You receive ten potions of improved healing. You receive two hundred francs. You receive two thousand XP. Level up. Congratulations. You are now level eleven. That means I have a hundred skill points to spend. I'd thought about using them on lucid dreaming and dreamwalking, but I have that potion of lucid dreaming plus fifty, so I might just hang on to my skill points for now. Breton ushers us deeper into the bureau. I follow him along walnut-panelled corridors with wooden floors, where our feet clip-clop like cloven hooves as we walk. I take it you want to investigate the strange object in the Bois de Boulogne, Breton says. I must admit, I have returned to Dream Paris and watched it from afar. It is very powerful. We talked of she of the dark young. I think she is doing something there. Breton shows us into the room of dreams. Only one of the couches is occupied. The bearded dreamer sighs uneasily in sleep. The rest of the couches are spare. Lie down here, Sally asks. Yes, if you wish. That is a particularly comfortable couch. I can't tell if he's joking or not. Breton is one weird dude. Sally lies and I take the next couch. Then we wait for the dream pipe. So, we're going to see if we can get into the bois via the dreamlands, she asks. Yes, that's it. It could be dangerous, Breton says. I say if we're lucky, they won't have the routes into the bois via the dreamlands guarded. They might not expect intruders this way. They might not. Then I'm handed a silver pipe. The female assistant lights the ball of dream weed and I get the sweet scent of the herb. I lie back, take a drag, and wait for the world to dissolve. I sink into dream. It is the most luxurious feeling. I blink and I can't tell if my eyes are open or not, but if they aren't, I can see through my eyelids. A smiling, smoky André Breton stands before me. I will be your guide again, if you wish. I know you are still not fully acquainted with Dream Paris. I don't answer. I look at Sally, whose dream form arises from her couch, looking round her. I've never been to the dreamlands before, she says. Come now. Rise now, Breton says, beckoning. Where are we going, Sally asks me. The roof, I think. We follow Breton up through the attics and the hatch onto the roof of the Surrealist Bureau. Sally stands on the dreamlike tiles of the roof, gazing over the roofs of Paris at shadowy buildings far and wide. Wow, she says. Then she looks up. Is that the moon? she asks. Breton shakes his head. No, it's the sun, but in this realm the sun is pale. I see the black siphon stretching towards it, getting even closer. I ask Breton what it is. He says, I've no idea. It looks ominous, though. The siphon is much clearer here in the dreamlands. It's like a weird leech or lamprey reaching up from the ground. I follow it down to where it's coming from. It's stretching up from the ground over to the west. At the same time, I see or rather sense the rhythmic pulsing I got the last time I was here. That came from the Bois de Boulogne, and that is exactly where the siphon extends from. Maybe it is something to worry about after all. How long has that been there? I ask. Breton says, just days. It's reaching for the sun, I think. It wasn't clear initially, but that's where it's headed, all right. So, which way is the Bois de Boulogne, Sally asks. Not sure, I turn to Breton. You were saying that I just needed to think about where I wanted to go and we would head there. Yes, Breton says, but it depends how strong your lucid dreaming is. I nod and take out the lucid dreaming potion that I got as a quest reward. I take a sip and I get a message. Lucid dreaming, now fifty. That'll last an hour. Okay, and how do others come along with me? Breton says, 
They just make sure they are holding some part of you. I offer my hand to Sally, whose pretty face shifts and flutters like a picture projected on silk. Tentatively, she takes my hand and squeezes my fingers. Breton reaches out to grab my other hand. Lead on, he smiles. I think of the Bois de Boulogne and we begin to move, striding through the smoky air, causing it to part before us in thick, heavy waves, like we were three boats cutting through dark water. We move from the roof and are floating until we come across the next roof. As we move faster and faster, we see strange things. In the distance is a funfair, lit up blue and red and yellow with a ferris wheel that spins and a big dipper. There are big tents also lit up. Sally points. That's pretty, Breton says. The carnival of nightmares. You don't want to go there. And then below us is a shadowy forest whose counterpart does not exist in day Paris. Between the trees I see red and white spotted fungi as tall as a house and other strange things slithering among the mist, whether animals or animated plants, I can't tell. Soon we're close to the Bois de Boulogne where the dark trees cluster together. I feel a pulse of what's in there, and a rhythmic twitching boom, 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 like a heart in atrial fibrillation. There's no guard wall here, and we can see into the woods. Behind them is a big building, very shadowy, like a nightmare version of the Kremlin taken root in France. Through the shadows, it's hard to make out what kind of place it is, but the pulsing energy is coming from that. That must be where they're doing the research, Sally says. I peer ahead. There are swarms of things moving in front of the building like ants, but we're still pretty far off and high up. We'll see them better as we get closer. We draw closer to the trees of the Bois de Boulogne, still stepping through air. What's that? says Sally. I follow where she's looking and see a bright ribbon of light. Mirror snake, I say. Not close, says Breton. Don't worry. We get closer to the Bois and I see the myriad little creatures that crawl over the ground are goats. Goats. And something else. Other creatures that walk on two legs. But they're not men. Then it gets harder to walk through the air. I see my exertion meter tick up, just hitting the top of green. We begin to slow, and the air's heavy like we're striding through molasses, struggling to pick up our feet. We're close to the first trees now, and it seems the closer we get, the harder it gets to move. What's happening? I ask Breton. I don't know. Some enchantment. Then great leathery things with wings of bats rise from the trees as if they were stationed there as sentinels. But before I can yell out a warning, I'm struck from below. Something bright and strong smashes into me, rocketing up through the boiling mist. Mirror Snake hits you for 300 health. Health, 800 out of 1100. I spin in the air like a stricken starfighter, and as I spin, I struggle to pull out the pistols from their holsters. Sally screams, Breton shouts, I didn't see it, but the mirror snake that bit me is coming for seconds. I get the pistols out and shoot. You damage mirror snake for thirty. You damage mirror snake for thirty-five. I need to get my damage up. This is just no good. Then the leathery flying things are on us. There are four or five of them coming at us like a cloud of corpse flies. I shoot. You hit Bayachi for four hundred. Critical hit. You hit Bayachi for a hundred and thirty. Two Bayachis fasten on Sally and wrap their leather wings around her. Their bodies are spindly like crane flies, but their wings are like bats. They're covered in a foul mush, like their flesh is decomposing and sloughing off while they yet live. You see something terrible. Sanity minus twenty. Sanity now, fifty out of a hundred. Another one comes from my right. Bayachi bites you for 75. Health, 725 out of 1100. Bayachi infects you with bloodlust. I shriek out in anger as I'm suddenly possessed by an enormous rage. I fire both my pistols indiscriminately, hardly aiming at all, and because of that, missing. The Bayachi bites me again. I guess the new bloodlust just adds to the duration. I am literally screaming out and seeing things through a red mist. First the Walther, then the Browning click as I empty the clips. 
At least I have some presence of mind to holster them before I whip out my sword, whirling round and almost decapitating the dream version of André Breton. Sally's having more luck. With her blasts of shadow, she has killed two Bayachis. I jab my sword into another. The mist around my feet is like glue, slowing me down and hampering my movements. The Bayachi turns on me and bites, causing more damage, but Sally blasts it from behind the blast of shadow entering into it and crumpling it like a bag. I scan the trees. There are more Bayahis sitting in the treetops, but they must be waiting until we get closer to the bois before attacking. I got XP from the kills, but my hits were so low that I'm going to need to put those skill points into pistols to up my damage. I sip health potion and check on my companions. Sally's also sipping health and mana potions, but Breton appears unharmed. The place is guarded, I say. Oh, we could have guessed that, I suppose, Sally says. Still, it was worth a try. If we get closer to the research facility, we'll get a ton more Bayekis on us. How's your sanity, by the way? I ask Sally. Okay, as long as I sip Soma, she says. At fifty sanity now myself, I'm going to have to start thinking of taking care of my sanity before it begins to affect me. But what now? I try to pull my feet out of the gloopy air. It seems to get thicker the closer we go to the bois. I say, my guess is that we wouldn't even make it to the bar before this stuff sets like concrete and we can't walk anymore. Some kind of protective magic they've set up to stop people entering the hospital from the dreamlands, Sally says. I guess. Sally says, with our feet glued in place, we'd be easy prey for the Bayekis. Breton says nothing. I turn to him. Did you know this was going to happen? He raises both hands in a placatory gesture. I knew nothing of it, brother. I swear, but there's something in his eyes that makes me not so sure, Sally says, so it doesn't look like we can get into the Bois via the dreamlands either, nor can we get into the wall in day Paris. I say there will be a way, we just haven't found it yet. Time to return to the Bureau. I know we've got time to kill before the dreamweed wears off and we can get back to day Paris, but we certainly can't go any further this way. I nod. As we make our way back from the Bois, the air thins out again, and soon we're striding as fast as ever we were back in the direction of the Surrealist Bureau. Then Sally points to glittering lights on the horizon. Mirror snakes, lots of them. Breton says, we don't want to run into them. Let's go right. Going right takes us to a strange area of the city. We're still at roof height, but on the rooftops at this level there's a lot of activity. Red lights festoon the chimneys and rooftop gardens. Women in scanty dress gesture lewdly as we get closer. Whether they're gesturing to me or Sally is hard to say. Breton says, There are lots of these red light harem areas in Dream Paris. Many players spend the bulk of their game time here. Sally sees me looking at a leggy blonde. You're not going anywhere near there, buster. Of course not. I'm a priest. She raises both eyebrows at that but we stride on, going fast now. We get closer to the Carnival of Nightmares. Closer up, it looks really ominous. I hear shrieks and screams, and they don't sound like people having fun. But then we arrive back at the roof of the Surrealist Bureau. No more mirror snakes this time, I say. No, says Breton. Better get into the building.